Ryan, the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association. And today we have a wonderful guest, Jason Zalin. Thank you very much for joining us today. And Jason can offer so much expertise in this field from VP of acquisitions to, uh, to producing. You've done producing and then there is business and legal affairs. And Jason has worked with Miramax, with Warner Brothers and with many other amazing companies. And we are really lucky to be able to get some advice from you, some practical advice on navigating <laughs> this challenging industry. <laughs> so thank you very much. And of course, we're going to start with how did you get started in this uh, difficult how did I? How did I wind up here? Um, Not with me here on the interview, but... Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's see. I was a theater arts major in college, and I always thought that I would wind up doing, being an actor or director or something in theater. Um, I somehow found myself, as lots of people do, going to law school because I needed a real job. <laughs> and um, when I got out of law school, um, I was looking for something in the entertainment, to be an entertainment lawyer. And unfortunately, the law firm that had hired me first to be an entertainment lawyer uh, lost a lot of their entertainment business. And they said, how do you feel about being a litigator? And I said, oh, not so great, but I did it for about two years. Okay. Until I decided, you know, this is not me. I'm, I'm, I'm not that, uh, that personality that it takes to be a, a litigator. And uh, I, I um, applied for and got a job at Warner Brothers. It was my, it's, well, I, before that I was doing some music law. So I, I, I did get an understanding of how to draft contracts, which is important in uh, negotiation skills. Mm -hmm. But uh, moving to Warner Brothers put me right in the heart of the business. And... Um, and I appreciated that because I had a, a wonderful mentor um, during my time there who eventually became chairman of Warner Brothers, Barry Meyer. Mm -hmm. um, Barry was chairman of Warner Brothers for about 15 years, I think. Mm -hmm. um, a real great guy, a straight shooter, smart, smart. And um, he gave me a lot of insights into how the business works and uh, what I should be doing. Um, because about four years in, I was getting very um, agitated that I was bored with uh, doing the same deals over and over again. And uh, I asked Barry, what should I do? And he said, well, if you, uh, the best way is to get a job offer from someplace else and then I can match that. <laughs> and I said, okay. Uh, so I put the word out and um, it's probably preceding a lot of people who are on the call now, but it was a company called Best Drawn Video. Mm -hmm. um, which was the first large-scale independent home video company back in, this is like 1984. And they needed somebody on the West Coast who knew the business. And uh, they weren't looking for a lawyer, but uh, I hit it off well with the head of the company and they hired me. And, well, they, they made me an offer. And the, the interesting thing for me was when I went back to Barry and said, you know, Barry, I've got this offer here. Now you could match it. And because I, I really, I didn't, you know, home video, what did I know? I said, um, you know, yeah, what can you do? And he said, well, I could match the number and I could make you a vice president. And he says, but I can't match the opportunity. And, and this was important. He, he knew back then in 1984, I said, what do you mean the opportunity? I said, this is, this is home video. I mean, what, what is, you know, I don't even know, I, I have a VCR, but what do you, what do you do with home video? And he said, no, 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 no. And he, said he pointed to he had a big tv back in those days the big gigantic tvs but they weren't the thin screens they were you know <laughs> huge and he says it can be on that tv he says it could be in a movie theater he says or and this was interesting he said or he says it could be on my watch he said it's content you will be in charge of acquiring content for a company and that's the name of the game this is you will have that opportunity. And the second thing, and this is advice to pass on, he says, you will have something that most people in Hollywood don't have. He says, including me, he said. And what's that? And he said, um, a checkbook. He says that he who has a checkbook and can write a check is in charge. Wow. That you will be, the you know, people will flock to you. People will look at you as being somebody more important than you are because you can write a check. And he was right. 
Um, we had an announcement for my joining the company and we had like a big party with 700 people. And within a few weeks, I was like the most popular person in Hollywood for that period of time because I could write, even though the checks I was writing was like 20,000, 50,000, I mean, these weren't big checks, but the ability to write that check meant that everyone wanted to be my friend. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember telling Barry years later how right he was. It, it made a huge difference. On the other hand, he, he also said, it will give you the opportunity to be on the creative side, which is something that I wanted to do. And he knew that my, um, my desire was to get involved with the creative process, not just the business. And what a position like acquisitions has is, it has the ability to use both halves of your brain so that on one hand you read a script or you see a, a trailer or, or you watch a movie and you go, I like that. That's great. Now I have to switch to the other part of my brain and go, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to distribute it? And how much is it worth? What am I going to pay for the right to be able to distribute this product? Because I'm the one that's making the judgment about the creative and how much money to spend for it. And I always found that the acquisition jobs throughout my career were the ones that were the most satisfying because they did utilize both halves of my brain in a way that um, purely creative or purely business or legal doesn't. Wow. So that was my start. And uh, I, you know, I look back, I, I look at Facebook, for example, and I look at my the friends that I have on, on Facebook, and there were probably, I don't know, 200 of them that were friends back in the Vestron days because they met me back then because I had a checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's uh, sort of how I how I started uh, in the film business, and then from there it was um, you know one job led to another. I spent time coming back and forth between uh, practicing law when when I was at it when when a company got merged. Like I was running acquisitions for a company called Lorimar, mm -hmm. which uh, at the time was a studio, and um, we, we actually bought the, what was the MGM studio now, the Sony's lot. And it, for about two years, there was a big Lorimar sign on top of it. And we were doing a lot of stuff and it was exciting being in charge of film acquisitions there. Um, but then um, about three years into it, um, as actually, I remember I was on my way to the Cannes Film Festival and I stopped in London because there were screenings in London before Cannes. And I turned on CNN International back in the day and uh, I saw that Lorimar had decided to merge with Warner Brothers. And there was no longer going to be a, Warner, a, a, a Lorimar. Um, and uh, I remember calling Barry <laughs> when I got back. And I said, Barry, you know, you didn't have to spend all this money just to get me come back. <laughs> you missed me, yeah. <laughs> but as it turned, as it turned out, um, there wasn't a job for me at Warner Brothers because they were not in the business of acquiring, they made all their own product mm -hmm. and they weren't acquiring products. So there was nothing for me to do. And I wound up being an independent producer. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, I had a contract, so it paid me for this for a couple of years, but um, that's how I wound up producing. Wow. So, that's that's a yeah. story where you have to recognize the right opportunity. That's. Yeah, and the I think the important thing is having a good mentor or more than one. Yeah, that's somebody who who knows the business and somebody who can give you advice and somebody who can open up doors and somebody that can um, uh, tell you not to do something that you you might do harmful you know harm to your you know, your credibility your reputation. Uh, and I was lucky to have him and a couple of others that were uh, there for me when I needed them. That's that, that's nice. Now that you've mentioned uh, the VP of acquisition, the job that you've really enjoyed, what are the secrets? What are studios looking for in terms of content? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very broad question in a sense. I mean, I, back then I was acquiring strictly for home video. Um, and years later, I acquired for theatrical, home video, television, all that, all the different uh, markets. And, you know, it, today, it's, uh, it, the business has changed a lot. And we'll get into that later when we talk about independent production and financing. But um, if I were a producer, and I am a producer today because I'm still producing things, um, what I look at is the material that I want to make and figure out 
who the audience is for that material. And based upon what that audience that I'm aiming for, the core audience, I mean, it can obviously cross over to other audiences, but if the core audience look and see how do they get their content? And that's what's changed a lot is that um, I have uh, two sons who probably uh, don't go to a movie theater more than once or twice a year to, to watch a movie. They do watch movies, but they'll watch them more often than not on their home screen or on their computer. Um, and the kids today will watch a lot of their content um, on their phone, which I find crazy being being of old school and, and I like to see the big screen and the, the effects and the you know um, but uh, you know Quibi is a good example of I, I think a mistake frankly I, I, I would not have bet on Quibi but they pursued the concept that everything you need is on your phone so that let's just produce content six minute pieces of content for your phone totally neg you know, negating any other kind of distribution uh, for that content. Um, so you, everything now falls into different silos where there are movies that are, I, I think there will always be a market for theatrical motion pictures of a certain type. Mm -hmm. And those type of movies are the big blockbusters. And the reason for that is obviously on a big screen, you get the full effect, you get the full um, force of a movie and, and the, the millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent on that movie, you can see it, you can hear it. You, you want to be in a place where there's a, a, a loud um, speaker system that the, when the bombs go off or the special effects happen, you're, you're in the midst of it. Um, so I think those movies, and the other part of it is that um, there's a certain communal aspect to movie theaters that you don't get, even when you're uh, watching the same movie as your friends and you're, um, while you're watching, they're watching at the same time in their homes, it's not the same. Um, it's, it's why they put laugh tracks on television comedies back in the 50s and 60s, because initially there was no audience and people didn't know when to laugh. They, were, they felt uncomfortable in their home laughing out loud when there was no audience. So they put a laugh track in so that you would feel comfortable and say, oh, okay, I can laugh now because other people are laughing. Well, the same thing holds true for comedies in theaters. If you've ever been to a movie theater to watch a comedy and, and it's a sparsely attended show, you feel a little funny laughing out loud. But when you have a community there, people that all get the joke together. Um, and I think that's something that as a society, we, we will always have. We'll always have those communal places that we will gather and watch art, comedy, big, you know, big movies. What is going to go missing, I think, in the, uh, the mix of things in terms of genres, because you'll, you'll find the horror movies will still go in theaters because nobody, I mean, people like to go to a movie theater and get scared together. <laughs> but what's going to have the toughest time are indie movies movies that cost less than say $5 million that are perhaps geared to a certain group. It might be a movie that's more for the uh, LGBTQ community or a movie that's for um, country Western or a movie that's a foreign movies. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, what's especially with the pandemic and theaters closing down and trying to start up again in the future, it's a tough sell to get people to spend $15 to go see a movie in a theater that they can see on their big screen at home mm -hmm. and um, not pay that. You know, you, you, you pay $15 for HBO Max or Netflix or whatever, and you get to see as many movies. It's, it's like going to a smorgasbord, you know, all you can eat. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the consequence of that is that the theatrical market for independent movies, unless it's a breakout kind of a movie, is going to be very different. It is difficult now, and it's going to be even more difficult in the future. Uh, so you have to find other ways of releasing that movie and making your money back. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing is to figure out who your audience is and what the channel of distribution is that that audience uses. Now, if I'm buying movies for a studio, uh, what I'm looking at are the elements. 
and the elements, the first element is a story. How is the script or is it a story? You know, and what, and what stage am I buying this at? Um, most executives at companies are, um, they're not stupid, they're very smart people, but they don't like to take chances. And what taking a chance means is you're, you're betting on a, a first time director or you're a, a first time screenplay writer or uh, a, a, a project that you like but has no stars attached to it um, or a director, it's a first time director. I mean, all of those are risks involved and in that the more you can eliminate the risk aspect of making that decision on behalf of the, uh, of, of the studio, the better off you are as a filmmaker. And that means that, first of all, the script should be final form. Don't send a script in that isn't a draft that you're proud of and feel comfortable shooting. It should be as close to a shooting script as possible. Um, the genre, you know, there are certain genres that are much more identifiable. Uh, then there are those that are uh, crossover, hybrid, um, compilation type, you know, where it's sort of a, a dramedy. Mm -hmm. So that it's funny, 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 and then someone dies. You know, uh, those are harder to sell because they don't fall into a neat category. So when you're dealing with an acquisitions person, assume that they are looking for something that they can pass on to their boss because they're not going to probably make. I, I was very lucky in my acquisition jobs in that uh, I was the boss, and I if I liked it, I turned to myself when I went to the business side and went, okay. <laughs> Um, you want to do this one? Yeah. And I would make that decision. Today, it, the, you have to go through layers. And those layers include running numbers. I used to run the numbers in my head, is what we call it, running numbers, where you would figure out, okay, I would make a little sheet and theatrical, and I'd make an estimate of what the rentals would be, what the box office would be, rentals would be, and how much I would spend on it. Then I would drop down to um, home video and how many uh, DVDs could be sold or how many uh, pay-per-views or, you know, and just, I would make a list of all the different things and add it all up. And I would then figure out what I could spend on that particular project, because if it didn't add up, you know, foreign, I'd have to put in what the foreign estimates were. And sometimes if I was working at a studio like, like Lorimar or Warner Brothers, I have a foreign division that I can ask and say, okay, how much do you think this is worth for foreign for, you know, all these territories. You add it all up, you come up with a number and you come back and if the number doesn't come make sense in terms of the budget, you know, the, and, and that's what I mean by you have to match the budget to what the expectation is. Mm -hmm. So um, a first time director with a, with his own script, uh, with a cast that's relatively unknown, uh, as much as I like the project, if the budget is $15 million, it's, it's probably a no go. Uh, if the budget is a million and a half, I might take a chance. I may take a risk. Um, I was, I was a village roadshow when I got the script for uh, being John Malkovich. And I fell in love with it. I thought it was brilliant. It was one of those things where you read the script, you go, oh my God, this is a voice. This Charlie Kaufman, whoever he is, really has a voice that needs to be seen. And I made the pitch for it in the meeting because I had to get buy-in from the foreign people and from the company and all the people to, together in order to make the deal. And even though the budget, I think, was about $2 million, you know, the foreign sell, the, the, the head of foreign distribution went, mm, I can't sell it. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, well, then we'll cut that. And it got to the point where I couldn't buy the project because it was too risky even with like a $2 million budget. Mm -hmm. So um, the important thing is to give the acquisitions person less, um, less questions. The, the more definite that you have, this is going to, and when I say more definite, the most definite you can be is obviously you've made the movie with independent financing. Mm -hmm. And now you take it to the festivals. Because, and that's why the numbers at the festivals, and I can give some good examples. Um, I remember when I was at Village Roadshow, we had a small it's Australian movie that, um, uh, what was the name of it? Not the airport, the, 
It was about a family that had a, a house at the end of an airport that was being rezoned and they were going to knock down the, the house. And it was a comedy. And it was like a, a, you know, a typical Australian sort of crazy comedy that we enjoyed, but we didn't know whether it would play in the United States. Well, we got it entered into Sundance and uh, I, I pushed to get it entered and at the, I wanted the midnight slot <laughs> on the first weekend because having been to Sundance a number of times, I knew that that's when people had partied. They were slightly drunk or stoned. Um, it was a crowd pleasing kind of a movie and that they would enjoy it. And what happened was it went gangbusters. Everyone just like, oh my God, it's so funny. And, and by the next morning, we, we made a deal with Miramax for $10 million for a million dollar movie. The movie subsequently didn't play in the United States very well, <laughs> I have to admit, because it was a small Australian quirky comedy. But in the rarefied air of uh, Sundance Film Festival with lots of alcohol, um, <laughs> People thought it was wonderful. And the thing is, it, they knew what they were buying. They could see the movie. No one could say afterwards, oh, it did turn out the way I thought it was going to. Well, no, you saw the movie. And that's the best way of making a sale is you have a movie that's all, and, and that increases the price also. Because if you, it's like a sliding scale in reverse. If you, um, if you have a screenplay and you don't have a director attached, then it's, you know, no one's, I mean, Companies will buy a screenplay, but then they'll put their own director and their own producers on it. But if you're, um, you know, you, you have a small package and there's very little to go on, then an acquisitions person is going to give you the, the, the least amount of money for it because they don't trust. Uh, at, when I was at Miramax, one of the things we would do with, with projects that we liked, but we weren't sure how it would turn out, we would mark, we, it would be marked for execution and review it. In other words, we were interested, we would follow it, but until we saw that it was going to actually be made and made in a way that was good, we weren't willing to take the risk on that movie based on the screenplay and a first time director. Um, so it's what stage it's at. You know, in, the more you can put into the package, the, the better it's going to be. And, you know, and the package is obviously the screenplay, the genre, the cast, uh, and the director, having a direct, you know, and this will touch on something later I'll come up back to, which is bonding a movie, because the director is a very important part of that package. Um, if the director is a first time director, I, I happen to like first time directors, by the way. Um, and, and stop me if I'm going off the rails here, because I don't know what's in. <laughs> um, I remember it, it was at Sundance. In fact, I bought a project and it was a restaurant called uh, Tokyo Pop. Mm -hmm. uh, director was a woman director, Franny Kazooie, mm -hmm. um, who was a Brooklyn born uh, Jewish lass who married an, uh, a, a, um, a Japanese film, direct, film producer and moved to Japan and became a pop star. And she made a movie about you know, her life doing that. Now, I thought this was really unique. I thought the script was wonderful. I, um, I, I would love to see the movie. And I spent probably over the course of two days at Sundance, um, probably four or five hours sitting down with her and going through the script page by page to find out if she really knew what she was going to do. Because I didn't know. She had never directed a movie before. And after putting her through the, that grueling process, I was able to say, okay, I'll take a risk on her. And it turned out to be a wonderful little movie. But the first, and this is something I, I, I think is a cardinal rule about first time directors. Um, most of them are doing their own screenplay that they've written and they have lived for probably 10 years. They have every shot already in their mind what they're going to do. They have a group of friends that they've made over the years before who are willing to do it for nothing. <laughs> that just, they want to, you know, they want to help out. That would be, they'll take a, a lowered fee with a bigger back end just so they can get this thing made. And everyone will sacrifice to make this. And it's, and it's a work of love. That's what it is. It's a labor of love for this first time director to get everybody on board. And then probably they, they, they'll call in favors from an actor friend who is probably bigger than the movie, but will do it because they want to help out somebody who helped them years before. Mm -hmm. I will never hire a second time director. Ah. 
much my that's the zone rule um because what i found and I, it's happened to me once or twice a second time director now has to pay back everybody oh. <laughs> <laughs> that they all those favors that they called in on that first movie now they have to hire those people and pay them like much more uh and generally if they're a second time director the first movie was successful enough that i'm looking at their second movie but they haven't spent the 10 years thinking about that second movie that second one is something they took off their shelf it's a script that they wrote in film school and you're like, oh okay here <laughs> and, <laughs> and as a consequence most second time movies i wouldn't say fail but i i you know i wouldn't stick my neck out for it. um that's a well, big way to put it. See, you don't think this through, but now that you're describing this, it's like... <laughs> have, having been through the process a couple times, yes, I see that uh, you, you want to get the benefit of all the favors that have to be done in the first instance. So I guess the best thing to say is figure out what your genre is, figure out who your audience is, and put together as best the package as you possibly can. And if you can get it financed independently, then you have the most to be able to show. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. That that was that was great. That that's a lot of guidance on what not to do and what to do. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> yeah. So let's move on to the um, entertainment lawyers. You also mentioned the career mm -hmm. of entertainment lawyers. So how do inter because you know smaller productions they're not as familiar with the concept. So uh, as companies get bigger. How can entertainment lawyers help production companies? Um, we represent, and I've represented a number of production companies, and, it, and it, there's a range of things. I mean, the most important part of any film and what a lawyer can help you with is obtaining rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's crucial because the last thing you want to do is to go down the road where you've done everything and except you don't have a chain of title. That's good. And then you bring, you know, and, and it, they show the movie to um, Warner Brothers or Sony, and they go, "This is great. We want it." And the first thing the legal department is going to ask for is, "Let's see the chain of title." And if you don't have a clean chain of title, you're going to lose the deal, because very few studios want to go back and try to clean it up, because what's happened now is maybe there were two writers and you only got the rights, you only got one to sign off and the other one went on a trip and you didn't get them to sign it. It's, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. And now they know you have a deal. So what that means is that the studio is going to have to pony up more money to be able to obtain the rights from the writer you didn't get the rights from before. And they have you over a barrel because you can't make that deal. You, no, no studio is going to go forward unless the chain of title is absolutely clean. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there's insurance that you can get for it, but the insurance company is going to make sure that the chain of title <laughs> is clean. So the, I think the first and, and probably the most important thing that a production lawyer can do is to make sure that the chain of title is correct. And that means if it's a life story, those are tricky. It may, you know, you may have a, and there may be multiple parts to the, to the chain of title usually are. So say it's a, uh, it's the life story of somebody, and it was a, a magazine article that was written about. You need to get the rights from the, make sure that the rights that the magazine writer got include film rights. Because if they don't include film rights, then you have to go back and get the rights from the person whose life story it is and the people around them. Now you've gotten that, and now you have to get the rights from the magazine writer because if you can't just get them straight from the, the life story because there may be things in the magazine article that you want to include in the movie and even though um you can have an argument made that if you got the life story and you have a new writer that writes it without talking to seeing the right that it's it's separate and apart but most studios and insurance companies are going to make sure well you know there's a it became publicized by this story get the rights to the story as well so those are the, the, the important you know, things you need to do. Um, if it's a screenplay, you have to make sure that you're obtaining not just the screenplay, but that uh, sequel rights, because what if you're successful and you want to have a sequel to it? Oh, you got to go. Now going back and trying to get the sequel rights after we have a successful movie is like, forget it. It's, you know, 
um, I want to represent the writer at that point, not the studio, because the writer has the leverage if it's a successful movie. Could you imagine if, um, you know, uh, any of any of the Twilight series, if they only got one? Yeah. What do you, so that's an important part of it. You want to get uh, remake rights. You want to get um, spin-off rights. You want to have, and you want to make sure that the rights are good for not just the theatrical, but for all forms. So a good example uh, today, you don't know if it's going to go theatrical. It may go streaming. You want to make sure that you have the streaming rights in total. You want to make sure that you have everything except what's con what's considered to be the reserve rights. And those are things that if you've ever dealt with a writer in the WGA, there are certain rights that are reserved, which are like the book publication rights. You probably can't get the theatrical, when I say the, the theater rights, the, you know, like a stage, if you were going to do a, a cat's version on stage that after the movie, God knows why. But if you were to do that, you want to make sure that you have the rights to do the stage version as well. Um, so those are some of the important things in the rights aspect. Then moving on from rights, um, financing. The lawyer is crucial in being able to put together the right kind of financing deals. And uh, we can get into it now or later, but someone asked, I think, the question um, about a negative pickup. Yeah. Um, a negative pickup is uh, it's a term of art way, way back when they were, and it was, it's not negative positive, it's negative, the film negative mm -hmm. is what it refers to. And what it, it, it harkens back to in a time when they used to have cans of film and they would pick them up. When they, you finished the movie and the bank signed off on it, you would pick up the negative, it was the negative pickup, and that was the deal that you made. And in, in broadest terms, or the simplest terms, a negative pickup is where you use the rights that you have sold off on the film to obtain a bank loan based upon what those deals are going to give you. Mm -hmm. So that um, if you have, say I have a screenplay and I've got the package and everything together and I go and I, Lionsgate loves it. And they're willing to, let's make it easier for, for the example, they're gonna buy worldwide rights. Mm -hmm. And my budget is $10 million. Now, if they're going to buy worldwide rights, they better come in with a deal that's more than $10 million because I can't make the movie otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, but if I, unless I have other financing like investors who will put money, that's a whole another topic. But if what will normally happen is if, if Lionsgate gives me a contract, what's called a, you know, an acquisitions agreement for $12 million, it gets discounted because you can't be sure that all 12 million is going to come because they have foreign deals. I mean, if they, they, they may lower the price on, they may take other things out of it. You just have to have more in contracts than the amount of the film budget. Mm -hmm. And what you do is that you then take that to a bank and the bank looks at it and they look and see, is, it, is, is uh, Lionsgate credit worthy? Yes, for argument's sake, let's say it's, a, they, it's an $8 million deal, so you're short $2 million. Now they look at, you have an investor who's willing to put the difference up, the $2 million. They look at the investment agreement, they go, okay, I've got the investment agreement, I've got a acquisitions agreement, the two together add up to 10.5 million. Um, how am I, but each one of those deals is contingent on delivery. Mm -hmm. So that if the movie, because of force majeure or a pandemic or because the star dies or because I go over budget or whatever it is, if it doesn't get delivered, then they, the contract doesn't come into play. Lionsgate's not going to pay the producer $8 million on delivery. At that point, the bank is going to be left holding the bag on that because they've lent you the money based upon these contracts. So what does the bank do? They go and they obtain an insurance bond. They go to a completion bond company or um, um, film finance. There are about three or four of them in the world now. I used to run one years ago called Completion Bond Company until we went out of business. It's a tough business. Um, and the completion bond company is the one that basically 
supports all of the deals, the, the investment deal, the distribution for domestic, distribution for foreign, uh, and puts it all together. And they are guaranteeing to the bank that the film will be two things. The film will be produced on budget so that no one's coming back to the bank for more money. Mm -hmm. And that will be produced on schedule because the deal with the foreign distributors, say, requires the film to be delivered by December 1st. Well, if you can't deliver it by December 1st, they can get out of the deal, which means the bank is going to be out that money. So it's up to the bond company to oversee the production and make sure that the budget is right, the schedule is right, and that this is actually something that is going to be delivered on time and on budget uh, so that the bank can get repaid its money. Uh, so it's, it's a crucial part of the negative pickup process is having a bond company that basically is the glue that holds it all together. And they have uh, a, a major agreement called an inter-party agreement that is, be and that gets signed between um, Lionsgate and the foreign distributor and the investor all sign on saying that if this happens, so that everyone knows where they are in the, in the pecking order in terms of money coming back, um, what happens if there's a delay, all those things get ironed out in that agreement. And you need a lawyer for that, obviously. Um, lawyers, you also need a lawyer for what's called production legal, because there are probably anywhere from 20 to 100 contracts during the course of a production that need to be signed. And that's all the cast, all the crew, all the locations, all the rights, uh, distribution deals, all these things come under the, you know, the, the, the context of a, a production um, production legal. And then the third is um, distribution. You want a lawyer to be there to make the deal with Lionsgate, to make the deal with your foreign distributors, to make the deal with Netflix or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess that, a long way of answering your question is that a, uh, lawyers are, are, are probably needed, in, unfortunately, at every step of the process. Yeah. You, you may not need them for um, premiere, but you should invite them. <laughs> yeah, and uh, can you please elaborate on how entertainment lawyers get paid? Like, that, how does that? Because I heard it, it's it, not just a uh, uh, forward. It depends. Well, there there are two types of, in a, in a broad sense, there are two types of entertainment lawyers. Um, my the kind of law that I practice and my law firm practices is as production counsel or as counsel to a producing company or to um, a number of different companies. And we get paid on an hourly basis. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, and it can be expensive, um, but you know, it, you, you get what you pay for in a sense, except for me, I think they, they bill me out at a rate that I can't afford myself, but um, I, I would never hire me at that rate. <laughs> uh, but no, they, that's the, the, these are the, you know, the bigger law firms that, that do that, that are on the production side or the studio side, so to speak. Uh, and then there are the talent lawyers and they operate a little closer to what a talent agent does and they take a percentage. Uh, so generally speaking, it's about a 5% um, deal that, they, that, most, that the lawyers that represent talent take. And um, you know, but that goes across the board. I mean, unless you make a special deal, if, if you hire an attorney, you can't just say, I want you to be my attorney for this project, but not for these two projects, mm -hmm. because this project you may wind up spending a hundred hours on and it's, you know, a small fee. And yet I'm spending, um, you know, time on the other projects that I'm not getting paid on a percentage basis. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So, Generally speaking, you know, you hire an attorney for your career, for that portion of your career mm -hmm. on a percentage basis. Okay, makes sense. And uh, what are some common challenges uh, that can be prevented by working with an entertainment lawyer? And some matters that filmmakers do not realize actually needs legal counsel. <laughs> <laughs> um, like some hidden stones in there. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, it, it depends on um, what you are in the process. I mean, if you're a producer, as opposed to a screenwriter, a screenwriter, you want to make sure that you are, um, what, what a lawyer is going to help you is to, is to protect your rights, to protect your reserved rights, to protect 
uh, your ability to do other things uh, may protect your exclusivity. If you're an actor, director, I mean, you, you may, the studio may want you to be exclusive as an actor for a period of time, and you may want to um, have the ability to do certain other projects that don't conflict with the one that you're doing. Um, if you're a producer, the, the, a lawyer who has been in production is your best bet. Someone who has, uh, in fact, been a producer is a good idea because they know what the tricks are. They know what the, the issues that are going to come up. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's important that you have somebody that will ask the tough questions and not just sort of, because producers don't like to ask those tough questions because oftentimes the answer is no. But you, <laughs> but you, so, and, and producers, and I would, you know, the advice I would give to producers, in fact, one of the questions here later is um, advice. And one of the things is don't take no for an answer mm -hmm. as a producer, because, you know, you, you will hear a lot of no, mm -hmm. but you do need to have a lawyer to be able to say no at a certain point, mm -hmm. because if you go cross, uh, if you were to use rights that you didn't really have the right to use, you're going to get in trouble and you might get away with it the first time, but chances are you're not, especially if you're successful. Mm -hmm. It's almost, do you remember the movie, the producers? Mm -hmm. um, they were counting on being unsuccessful mm -hmm. so that no one would look into their financing. Well, you don't want to be that kind of a producer because you want to be successful, but if you're successful and you haven't dotted the I's and crossed the T's, you're going to find yourself in a, a, a whale of trouble down the road um, when you didn't listen to your lawyer who said, don't do this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what were some biggest changes that were caused uh, in this field? Well, we, we've gone... And by the pandemic as well. I'm sorry? Generally, okay. at the time and by the pandemic as well. Right. Uh, well, there are the two issues. I was going to say, um, well, let me share my screen for a second. This is a chart of distribution. Mm -hmm. This going back probably oh, 10 years. I mean, when I, when I first was in the business, this is holds pretty true for back then for many, many years where all these um, film production, television production, where the, had similar ways of being distributed, if you can follow this. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a theater, you can buy it in your theater, you can see it through your television, you can see it through your cable, or you can see it through your set, your te your set box top. And what that allowed producers to do was you had various ways of, of obtaining uh, revenue. And you would add all these different revenue streams, unless you made an overall deal, you would add all these, these revenue streams together. Uh, and that's how you would come up with your budget. What has changed in the last, uh, well, it, it was sort of going in this direction. And I think what's happened is, um, find the other one. What's changed in the last few years, and especially lately, is this is the way it looks. Oops, didn't come out. Why did that work? For some reason, that's not coming. Um, now, what I was going to say is that this whole area that's in the middle here is one that is changed to be streaming. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes a, a big difference in a number of ways. When you only have one revenue stream, um, what it does is effectively, it does away with the back end. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the biggest change that I've seen in the last few years, which has now been accelerated because of the pandemic. The two things came together. As of um, a year ago, Netflix and Amazon were not giving back ends. And those are two of the biggest buyers in the business. And the reason why they don't give back ends is because there is no profits to share. It's not like a pay-per-view where every time it happens, you, you, you get a, a dime, you get a dollar. Mm -hmm. It's not like um, 
rentals for video. It's not like downloads. It's not like going to the movie theater and paying for a ticket. You pay $15 a month for the privilege of getting as many movies as you want. And while Amazon and Netflix know what you've been watching, the producers don't. Mm -hmm. So there's, they may have an inkling that, you know, their film was very successful so that the next time they make a deal with, the next time they make a deal with Netflix, they may ask for more money. But the fact is that there isn't a back end. So what's happened in the last couple of years is that if you make it, what the, the, the typical deal at Netflix or Amazon is, um, it, it sort of cost plus 20%, cost plus 15%, in some cases cost plus 25%. Basically it gives you a back end up front, mm -hmm. but not as, it, it gives you a, a moderate back end, let's put it that way. So that if you are a producer that was going, that is, um, would normally make Mm, let's say $100,000 on a movie. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, that would make $100,000 on a movie. Um, your deal at Netflix or Amazon might be for $120,000. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. You get that, but you get that money up front, but that's it. Mm -hmm. There is no further income coming off of that. So they can use it for, every, even if they sell it to somebody else, they, you're not, going to see another dime from them uh, because they, they bought the whole um, kit and caboodle, as they say. Uh, so that's why they pay a premium up front and you get your film made. That's the advantage. The, dis the disadvantage is that if you have a, a major hit on your hand, say it was, you know, if you had taken it to a studio and taken less money up front, but it was a back end, you would see a lot more money, especially if it's an indie movie at a, at a lower budget. Um, now, what you're also avoiding though, by selling your, your project to Amazon or Netflix is audits, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to chase your money. You know, if they write you a check up front for 120% of what your fee would be, then that's what you get. Whereas the deal that you make with Sony, even if it's a hit five years out, you may be still in court trying to you know, decide whether your project spawned all this money in merchandising or other things that you have to now audit them for. Uh, you may be successful, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a much tougher road to go. So it's, you know, and I see the industry is really changing in that direction. Um, it's sort of ironic that um, last year, if you recall, one of the big stories that was going on was the fight between the talent agencies and the writers guild. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, the reason for the fight was over what would um, packaging deal. And I won't go into the details of what a packaging deal is, but most people you know, understand it's a percentage, but it's a back end. And it basically caused a rift in the industry for a year. I think they're now probably solving all of them. I think they're all probably solved. But the fight is over something that will not exist probably a year from now because packaging deals are contingent upon contingencies and there are no contingencies when you're dealing with Amazon or Netflix. And what's also happening is that Disney and I'm not sure if Warner Brothers yet, but a couple of the, the studios are trying to see if they can do the same thing and just cut out net profits. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably the biggest change in, from a legal point of view, what's going on. Um, the other reason why you need a lawyer right now is because of the pandemic and you need someone to sort through all of the protocols and all the rules and make sure that you are up to speed on dealing with what the SAG requirements are, because um, they're the, the union that, that handles most of it. But it's also below the line too. You want to make sure that you've got a safe and, um, uh, healthy environment in order to shoot your, your movie. Yeah, that's definitely challenging right now with, with all those regulations, not just legal ones, but generally, you know, such a Oh yeah, no, it's, it's I, well. I, I, I've been to probably two or three different seminars going through the protocols and what we can do and how we can do what, what we need to tell our clients mm -hmm. and how they can do it. But what it's also done is, and this is something for producers to understand, is that it probably adds anywhere from 10% to, I'm guessing now, 30% to the budget. 
in order to satisfy the protocols, whether it's having a bubble, a, a hotel that everyone stays in for two weeks before the shoot and stays in together and, and policing it. And it's, you know, it, it can be done. Uh, a friend of mine just came back from Bulgaria and they shot a movie there. Now, I don't know if Bulgaria was quite up to speed with what SAG after wants, but you know, it, uh, it was, they shot the movie. Yeah. So it, it like can't be done. Tell me about that. Maybe it's the same friend. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and oh, no, Bulgaria has become the biggest, yeah. the, I think, the capital of uh, European filmmaking these days. I heard, I heard. It's beautiful too. So a lot of beautiful locations. All right. So uh, what, the talent deals, you brought up talent deals. So what should filmmakers pay close attention to when negotiating talent deals? I, I think the most important thing is when you're, is how close you are to production and schedules are really the most important you know i mean negotiating for the fee and all that that that's within a range you know they quote what their previous quote is you go no i'm going to this this and you have arguments on the dollar figures but the things that can bite you are scheduling mm -hmm. and that's something that the bond companies are going to look at very if you if you are bonded look at carefully because um you know you you have a day out of days and you have your schedule set up and you know exactly which could happen the first week, the second week, the third week. Um, and you want to make sure that your actors, you have enough carryover, because if there's a problem, if especially in, in quarantine now and, and COVID, uh, you, you may be delayed by two weeks. And so the question is, is this force majeure? Now, contracts are trying to exclude force majeure from uh, uh, an occurrence that will keep you from uh, having liability. Because and the, and the insurance companies are in fact there's a lawsuit I know just now where a, a filmmaker had a contract that um, they they entered into with an insurance company last year to go through I think October this year mm -hmm. and because the film kept getting postponed due to um, the pandemic normally what would happen is you can renew your insurance mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, Two weeks before the October 1st date, you would call your insurance broker and go, we got pushed back in our schedule. I want to, ins I want to push this. I, I want to extend for another six months. And they would go, sure, no problem. Well, not now. Because when they entered into this, there was a force majeure in the contract. Now they're saying, we'll extend you for six months, but we're going to exclude force majeure. Wow. Meaning that you don't get covered if two of the cast get sick and we had to close down the production in for two weeks. I'm sorry, that doesn't count. So it's, it's getting very, very tight. You know, if you do get insurance, you're going to pay a lot for that premium to be able to cover yourself for force majeure. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the schedule is important because people may have now, maybe they're not working as much today because of the pandemic, but uh, in the past and hopefully in the future, you have an actor that only has a window of six days because they're on TV series and they have a hiatus and they have to get back or they have to be some for another movie shooting someplace else. You want to make sure that all these dates jive with your schedule and give yourself enough of a buffer before and after so that you don't lose that actor on the crucial day of shooting. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that had, and this goes to another issue I was going to bring up in terms of what is the skill that you if you're a producer that you you need to have most yes and uh, as a question and i would say the thing that's both most suited me is mediation skills mm -hmm. because that's what you do as a producer um now i have a mediation practice actually as a lawyer where uh you listen to both sides and try to figure out you know solutions to problems but that's what producers do and the ability to listen to what the other side is saying not just sort of go in there and say this is what has to be have to do it this way this way because um i, I get countless stories more stories uh, one of my first the first picture I, I i set up for production in vestron this was back in like 1985 or six we were doing and my boss at the time who was the head of the company was known as a really tough deal maker and he insisted because i had this producer over a barrel he insisted that i make a really tough deal. And I said, 
you don't understand. I said, you don't want that reputation that you take everything from somebody just because you can. You want to leave some money on the table so that they have a stake in this as well. And he said, no, 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 let's just lock up that deal. He's stuck, he's tied up, he can't do anything, let's do it. And I said, mm, you'll see. And when we got into production, the producer had no incentive to, to cut costs or to keep on schedule or he didn't care at this point. And we wound up spending an additional million dollars on the movie that was budgeted a million. It cost two million, which should have been one million because we screwed the producer yeah. on that. We weren't listening to what was what would make sense. Um, it's quite and that's an important. Yeah. It's an important part. When I as the bond company, uh, do I have time for a, a quick story? Please, yes, that's uh -huh. what I'm here for. <laughs> um, I was we, I was overseeing the production of a movie called Shortcuts, a Robert Altman movie, uh, which it turns out I love. But um, Altman was known as being an irascible type. Um, he was gruff, and he wanted things his way and he was he was not an easy character to deal with. And I was the suit because the Bond company was seen as the, you know, I'd come onto the set when I come there and I'd be wearing a suit and it's like, oh God, we have to listen, you know, to, to him. Um, well, this one day I was uh, visiting my, uh, I had a three-year-old or four-year-old at the time and it was this uh, preschool. Uh, and it's a, it was sort of a Montessori type of a preschool where they have the parents come in and watch the, as the, the teachers deal with the kids and you know, dealing with conflict and having them, you know, listening to the kids and having them do things in a way that, you know, was very, very, um, you know, protective of the kids' personality and, and all. And I learned a lot in that. And what I did is I took what I learned in that class because I got a phone call while I was, it was one of my, my first cell phone, I got a call from the, the head of the company saying, we have a big problem on the set of sword shortcuts and it's you know, it's in town. Can you go there now? So I ran over there in, in the house in Ladera Heights, I remember, and I get in there and like, oh God, it's like, here's the guy with the suit coming in. And I saw Bob Altman, he was like behind one of the cameras there and he had his headphones on and it was like steam was coming out of his ears. He was so upset with something. And I go, uh oh, this is gonna be a problem. And I remembered what I learned in that you know, that preschool class. And I went over to him and I, I put my arm around him and I went, Bob, I could see you're having a really, really hard day. And he went, yeah, I'm having a really, really, this is there. And I said, yeah, I said, I could see that. And I said, let's, maybe we should take a time out. And he goes, no, okay. I said, let's go over there and let's talk, Bob. He goes, okay. I said, and I listened to him because directors and creative people I found are like three-year-olds. They want to be heard. Yes. They want to feel that they've been listened to and they, they, that they're heard. And what we do as a society is we, we allow creative people to act more like three-year-olds than the rest of us. But then when push comes to shove, we go, oh no, you can't do that. No, no. And my attitude was the same with my three-year-old is if you're not going to hurt yourself, I'll let you do something that will knock something over as long as you then fix it. And so I, I said to Bob, I, we, I, I drew him, I had a piece of paper on, on the desk there and I said, okay, this is your canvas and I will do everything in my power to make sure that you, I don't care if you want to do it in red and black, if you want to scribble on it, if you want to paint it, you want to, whatever it is, I said, but all I ask two things. I said, one is that you don't go outside the, you don't paint the walls, you paint everything, this is your canvas here. And that is like your, your budget. As long as you don't go over your budget, I will protect your ability to get whatever you want on screen. And then, and the second thing is that, you know, you do it in a way where you don't harm anybody else in the process. I said, if that's the case, I said, I'm with you 100%. And the movie came in on budget and on schedule because I believe this because I listened to him. I heard his complaints and I, and the same thing holds true, I think, for producers working with writers, working with, al with talent, is that you need to listen to that. It doesn't mean you have to take their opinions as gospel or you have to agree with them, but listening to them and then making a decision is much better than just deciding. For, because I know producers who do it the other way and people can't stand working with them and they'll only do it if you pay them the premium 
Uh, and they'll also look for whatever chance they have to screw you because you, you, you've upset them so. So um, I learned everything I needed to learn in kindergarten, so to speak. <laughs> I really do because I am actually I actually run educational centers for kids, early childhood education. So mm -hmm. I am a big activist in that sense, and I believe that there is a reason that it's important to put kids to preschool because they learn some key personality traits and and the social interaction is just that's where you get the the basis of it. So I love it. I love that story. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, it, it taught me a lot about how that creative people are, are like kids. I mean, kids are creative and it's only when we, we constrain them, we, we give them rules and we make them do certain things, they lose that creativity. And I don't want the director to lose that creativity. Sure. I just want them to color within the, you know, color on the paper, don't color the walls. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. That was fantastic. Now, we went over negative pickup, and now we get to the do's and don'ts when signing an agreement from both the company or studio, and also screenwriter standpoint. I think we went through the uh, companies and the studios, but now how can screenwriters protect themselves? Um, if you're talking about a finished screenplay, mm -hmm. um, you want to look and see, I think we mentioned what, what rights you're granting and you want to grant as few rights as possible. Okay. Now, the studio is gonna want as many rights as possible. We went through that the, side it, now, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> the, the, the good news is that if you're a member of, the, of WGA, mm -hmm. certain rights are already embodied as reserved rights in the WGA agreement. The studio, if they're going to, if it's television, there's what's called separation of rights, and if you pay over a certain amount for a screenplay that's going to become a TV series, it entitles the studio to then negotiate with you at that point for other rights down the road. Mm -hmm. But if it's for a film, there is no such thing as separation of rights, which means that you want to maintain and not give away those rights, which could become very valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, they, there may be an argument as to um, you've written a book, they're buying the book. Um, you may want first crank at the screenplay. I think that's an important thing. If my client had just written, uh, in fact, I, I bought a book years ago, which hopefully one of these years I'll make into a movie called Killing Pablo. Um, it was a it was a bestseller in New York Times and all that. And uh, oh, it, that's a whole other story that uh, that'll go in my book about <laughs> how this business works. You know, it, it was literally the Wizard of Oz. Go out and get me. The the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West and come back here and we'll make your movie. Um, but it, <laughs> in, in that case, I liked uh, the, 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 uh, the fellow who wrote the book, Mark Bowden. Mark had also written a book called Black Hawk Down, which was made into a movie about three years before that. And he wrote the screenplay for Black Hawk Down, which they then threw out. Uh, I don't think they even looked at it because they had a screenplay writer in mind so that, and the screenplay writer didn't want to look at, the, he didn't want to do a rewrite, he wanted to do a, an original screenplay, so he never looked at Mark's screenplay, which when I read, I said, this is a good screenplay, he's a good writer. So I hired him to do the first draft of the screenplay for Killing Pablo. Uh, if I'm representing a writer, or I am a writer, I want that opportunity. Because you're never going to get it on a, a you know, a, a screenplay that doesn't have that as a backdrop. In other words, since you own the rights to the book, they can't make the movie without you. They will probably, now they may never use your screenplay, mm -hmm. um, but at least you have a, a shot at doing it. And I think that's a, the most important thing that you can get if you wrote a book. Now, if it's just a screenplay, um, you want to be able to have a number of shots at rewriting it. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want it to be just an acquisition you, because if it's just an acquisition, they can do the same thing. <laughs> so you want to be able to at least bring it to a point where someone at the studio goes, this is really good. Maybe we'll have someone come in and polish up the dialogue or maybe we'll do a little twist here or there, but you will get you know, story by credit and screenplay, shared screenplay credit at that point if you've written that well of a screenplay. So that, that's the most important. Then the other thing is just down the road is what rights you retain. 
And if you're, um, you, you, you may want to retain, especially today, uh, gaming rights. Are, are, could be very now not for every movie obviously but if there's a there's a chance that it could be turned into a game or into a virtual reality or you want to have what studios have and i remember way way back it was they're acquiring all rights and any rights in the future whatever those might be forever in the future so it's like they didn't know what what to call they don't know what streaming was back in 1984 but they had the catch-all phrase that would include streaming back then so you want to be able to narrow those things down so that if they want streaming, they pay for streaming, but they don't get hologram rights. <laughs> I'm making it up, but you know, <laughs> hologram rights may be important. Um, in fact, I was just talking about it yesterday with somebody where we're, uh, I'm on the board of a, th uh, of a theater and we're streaming, we're live streaming performances that are done in boxes so that people can see it. And I said, well, you know, it may not be so far in the future where, but you can do holograms and that people might, that, you know, we laugh now, but it could be a year or so from now that holograms, you could see a, a stage performance in your own home when you sit back. You want to keep those rights. Yeah, that's true. Merchandising, mm -hmm. very important. Um, I know the attorney uh, at Fox who, when um, George Lucas uh, was, doing first, he, he had done one movie and he was doing Star Wars, I'm not sure, and he, uh, <laughs> he was going over budget mm -hmm. and Fox came to him and they said, um, we're going to deduct, if, if you, we're either going to cut the budget and you're going to lose scenes or lose whatever it is that you're gonna have to cut back on, or you can contribute some of your salary to pay for the overage because you're taking too long and you know, and he contributed some and then, then he started going over more and they said, well, you don't have much of it. You know, he says, well, um, he says, I'll contribute my budget, my, my, but I want, you know, the merchandising rights back. I don't want to give those up. Yeah. And Fox thought, well, what are merchandising rights worth on a science fiction movie, right? <laughs> Lucasfilm was built on that clause. Yeah. Um, so it's an apocryphal story, but um, I, I think he, yeah, you, you, you know, whoever gave, he gave up the rights to all that money in order to save the company probably $50,000. Yeah. Um, so you want to be on the other side of that. You want to be the person who says, you know what, I'm keeping my hologram rights and I'm going to keep my VR rights and my, my AR rights and uh, any other rights that I might have in the future. Yeah. You get streaming. That's it. Okay. So, you know, it, you know, it may be hard in a studio situation. If you're doing it with a smaller company, they may, because they're not going to spend as much, they may be willing to give you those rights back. Mm -hmm. and, and then that's an important thing to keep. Okay. And uh, when the screeners are just pitching, do they need anything <laughs> besides uh, the copyright, just official copyright, that gov uh, copyright? Or do they need anything else from the legal standpoint to protect them? To protect them from During what the I mean process when they're just sending it around, pitching it around to different oh oh companies. um well you you get a copyright mm -hmm. when you write it it's mm -hmm. not you don't have to uh, do anything to perfect the copyright it, it, it you obtain it legally the moment you finish writing something and put your name on it uh, but in order to sue for copyright infringement, you need to register that with the copyright office. So that just means, I think it's like a cover sheet or something, and it's a, I don't know, 50, what it is today, 50, $75 fee. So that entitles you to sue on the copyright of the, of the screenplay that you've deposited with the, uh, the office. Some people believe in, and I'm not sure, it, well, they'll send a copy to the Writers Guild Okay. You know, and so that to show what the time was that they sent it at this time, and then I pitched it the day after. So therefore, it was in existence before these people read the script, and now they they stole my idea. And you can so that's another way of at least establishing a timeline as to when you wrote something. But, um, but you any other legal precaution or just copyright, and that's it. Copyright's the basis for it. you know you don't. Um, I mean, you have a good lawyer who's, yeah. you know, 
you, when you're presenting, and this is if you're an unknown screenplay writer, uh, most studios won't accept your, your submission. As you probably know, they will accept the submission from an agent or a recognized lawyer in the field that they, because the idea is they, and I remember sending out, sending back scripts that I would get and I would say, this script is unopened, we have not looked at it, and um, please, you know, submit it through the, these proper channels. And the idea is that if someone is in business with the studio, like my law, law you know, anybody at my law firm who submitted a script, they know that we vetted it and that the person's not crazy and that they you know if we're going to sue it's going to be on a basis of some legal um uh, illegality that's real not that somebody made up an idea that you told you took my idea and i pitched it to you and now you made a movie and i thought you owe me money mm -hmm. so um using a lawyer or an agent is for that is probably a good idea mm -hmm. and uh lawyer and or agent are the ones negotiating already the financial aspect of that uh, sale right for the screenplay right yeah i mean they, they would be the ones to to do that i mean if you um the the advantage of a lawyer over an agent is um probably that they're they're cheaper <laughs> In a sense, I mean, if you, if an agent is, it depends what kind of kind of a lawyer. I mean, if you're uh, uh, on an hourly basis with somebody, and it takes a long time, it could be more money. Mm -hmm. But if you know, if the agent sends in the screenplay and they come back and they offer you one hundred fifty thousand dollars, then the agent collects seventy five hundred off the top. Mm -hmm. So you know, you have to sort of balance it out and see, you know, at what level this is, what what are you hoping to get, and you know, what kind of protections you need. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Now, uh, how do you effectively arrange film guarantees? And that was one of your specialties. Um, it's important to have a film guarantee if you're an independent production. Because I would never, I mean, I, I can't imagine an investor putting money into a film without having that guarantee because they, you know, the, the guarantee does not guarantee the movie is going to get distributed. It doesn't guarantee that it's going to make money. It just guarantees it's going to get made. And that's, you know, you need that to trigger probably the, the contract with the studio or the foreign sales agent or whomever. So you want to make sure that it gets delivered on time and on budget. So that's why you need the guarantee. Um, as a bond company, the things that I, the red flags for me, let's see, um, filming on water. Okay. That's, that's always a tough one. I'm not saying you, now this is not to say you can't do this or so just saying if you just think of it the, the red flags that come up you have to be you have to resolve the issue knowing that okay they're going to be shooting on water but it's going to be in malta and it's going to be on they have a special stage there in malta that lowers and raises and the water level and it's you know it's all controlled it's not like you're shooting on the high seas someplace where you could lose a ship or a person or something so you want to make sure that it's contained. Uh, shooting in water. Um, children. Children are always because not just do they, you know, that they don't perform well, but you have to have, for example, if it's a baby, you have to have a, the twin baby because you can only use a certain number of hours. If children have very limited hours, which means you have to structure your schedule around the kids. You have to have someone on board who is a teacher that's a chaperone for the child you have i mean it's just a lot that goes with having a kid and so it's it's not these are not like i said these are red flags just saying okay how are we taking care of these issues um special effects mm -hmm. oh you can't just have oh and i'm putting forty thousand dollars into special effects no i want it broken down i want to know what your deals are with the particular houses who's doing what how long is it going to take? What is it going to cost? Because special effects have a way of getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, we want another lightning shot in this one. And we want, oh, we want, and, and then all of a sudden the, the budget doubles because of special effects. Um, kids, special effects, what else? Um, and just the, the health issues that we, we're going through now, just to make sure that everything is the protocols and that are being followed and, and watched. Um, so that's how you know you and you can go to more than one film guarantor and just see because they're generally in the same range, but some of them are more lenient. And I would look upon some people look upon bonds as being a necessary evil. 
that, oh God, I have to go to Bond. Oh yeah, I, I want someone that's gonna lay low and leave me alone and we're gonna shoot in Bulgaria so they won't have anybody there. And you know, your Bond company should be your friend mm -hmm. because it's almost like having another producer mm -hmm. on board because they're really worried. They're the ones that are going to. And from a Bond company point of view, the people that I look at most are the director and the line producer, not the person who's coming to me who's the executive producer of the movie, who's put together the deals and saw the product. No, I want the person who is going to be on the set every day. And I want, and those people have track records. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we, we had like gradings on all the line producers in the business when I was at the Bond Company. And we know, oh, they're using, a, we had a problem with him three years ago where he got drunk and did it, you know, and you know that they, it, those stories stay with you. Good. So you want a line producer that the bond company trusts so that the, the budget is a real budget, that the shooting schedule is a real shooting schedule and they work with them on that. Now on a director, there are some directors who have a, a, a reputation for being a pain in the ass. And you know, it's not that you can't work with them, but you want to make sure that your director has a good relationship with the bond company because they're the ones that they have to sign off on it. First time directors goes back to what I said before. Um, they want to make sure that the line producer and the UPM and everyone around that first time director is really, really solid and good because you're counting on them on a daily basis to make sure that that first time director doesn't have a freak out when the, the, uh, uh, the, the shot that he had in mind can't work because the building is too close for the boom to, you know, you, what do we do? Well, you want someone who's seasoned, who's going to go, you know what? We should, let's reverse the angle. Let's do it this way. You go, oh, okay. That's, you want somebody like that on the set who's going to be able to do it, not the friend of the director. Uh, and let's see what else. You, the most important thing is you want to avoid a takeover. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when the Bond company takes over is they, they cut the movie to, to ribbons. <laughs> uh, you, you know that extra day of shooting that you really wanted because you wanted to get that close up in the seat? No, not going to have that. Right. Remember that that, that, um, uh, that tracking shot that you were going to have with a giant boom that was going to go? No, not, we're going to shoot that on roller skates now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I had that happen. I, I literally had, um, I remember when I, I was on, uh, what was the movie? Fried Green Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. If you remember that movie. Um, Fried Green Tomatoes was actually a terrific movie. Um, and everything was going along schedule until it was like a 10 week shoot until like the eighth week or, or so. And all of a sudden, all these cost reports came in that had, they had been keeping in a drawer. And so we went and we keep like a, a hot file just to see who's going over what subject, what, ca what categories. And it was fine until like the eighth week and then they delivered all these costs that we hadn't seen before uh -oh. and the movie was now like a million dollars of budget <laughs> in one week it went from from being on budget to being a million dollars over and they did it on purpose where they had the schedule that the last week of shooting was jessica tandy in one room so there was nothing i could cut <laughs> i mean i mean how do you save money on having you know an 80 year old actress sitting in a room reminiscing for you know that was the last week of shooting and we had we so my boss at the time says well we're going to cut everything out of post-production we're not going to sweeten anything we're not going to allow extra music we're not going to i have to say i have to get back that claw back that million dollars somewhere and we're going to cut it and i got a call from the head of uh universal who was a friend of mine at the time and uh he says jason this is a really good movie don't ruin it and I said, I read the script. It's a really good script. It's a great movie. I he says, come in and see what we've done. So I'll show you the daily, show you some, you know, dailies. And I went and I saw it. And I said, yeah, this is a really, he says, so what can you do? How can you keep my boss from cutting everything out and ruining, ruining this movie just to save the money? And I said, well, let me see what I can do. And I went back to her and I said, I'm going to make a deal that's never been made before. I'm going to get a profit participation from them for you, for the bond company. I said, because we're investing at this point, we should be seen as investors. Yeah. 
and they they broke with precedent and universal gave us a very a small first dollar gross sliver until we recouped as an investor and then we got a profit participation after that and as it turned out they made the movie and it turned out to be great and we got all of our money back from that little sliver of first dollar gross and then about six months later we got a check for like fifty thousand dollars which was profits <laughs> my boss called me and she goes, I've never gotten a profit before on a movie. I said, and the, the trick to that was listening. Once again, it was listening to what their needs were and what our needs were and seeing a way to come where we could take a risk, but have an upside that we didn't have before. Um, so, you know, it, it all sort of comes to bear is that you keep an open mind and not close it off. And, you know, the movie went on to win some Oscars, I think. And, uh, you know, and, and it made money for everybody. But, you know, we could have just choked it. Yeah. And, you know. Thank you. That's inspiring. That's definitely quite a lesson, you know, to, to know when to cut and not to cut, you know, to be yeah. an <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's not easy sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and um, now that's that's a tough one. What is the key for effectively handling negotiations for bank financing and bonding of films, as well as the creation of insurance-backed film funds? Easy answer to that. Oh, get a good <laughs> get, get a good lawyer. All right. <laughs> I, and and I, I mean that because it's even though I've run part of a bond company, I've made these deals. I I don't consider myself to be an expert in any one of these deals to the extent that the people who are, you know, the, the person who's representing the bank just does bank financing. Mm -hmm. The person who is doing the bond, so bond he just does bond company stuff. The distribution company has um, obviously someone who handles just distribution deals. You want somebody who has experience with all that. You don't want to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. It gets very complicated. There's, an, like I said, there's an inter-party agreement between all the three sides. You want someone who's done it before and who knows the people because it's the same lawyer who represents Comerica Bank over the years, the same person represents this bond, and they know the shortcuts. They know how to, you know, to get to the, to the end without killing each other and making a fair deal. You don't want to do it yourself. That's, this is the, it, it's like, brain surgery in a sense. I, I don't do it myself. <laughs> you want someone who, who can really handle all those aspects um, for you. And if you've gotten to that point, you can afford that lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fair point. All right, now we've gone over some challenging legal situations, but do you have any fun stories for us? Challenging legal situations that filmmakers commonly encounter, and how do you usually deal with them? Oh, uh, <laughs> trying to think of what, other than those stories, um, when I was producing a TV series called The Aquanauts, uh -huh. um, and uh, we, we sold, it was, a, it was one of the early reality type TV shows. It was about, we had three crews of a man and a woman uh, who went uh, around the world and scuba diving and cultural things in the same place that they were scuba diving so you would you would go to um scuba dive off of tulum and you would go to the mayan caves as well and see the you know how the mayan culture interfaced with what you see underwater there and um it was interesting but the problem is that I was a village roadshow and they uh, unbeknownst to me they sold the project this is when we bifurcate the rights they had sold the domestic rights to discovery and the foreign rights to end them all. And those are two very different companies in terms of their attitude. And so we, we wound up having to shoot a number of the scenes two different ways, well, especially when they were at, not underwater, the underwater stuff was fine, but was because end them all wanted all the women to wear their wetsuits with it zipped all the way down. So they wear a bikini underneath with their wetsuit on and, you know, and they would be walking around, they would do, in a lab talking about lichen or something, but they would be wearing, you know, Europeans prefer that. Yeah. <laughs> we had then, okay, come back again and zip up your wetsuit and put your lab coat on and now we're doing it for discovery. 
<laughs> so you've got to you know think about who your audience is and who you're selling it to and what kind of budget you have to be able to do it both ways. Yeah. Um, that was also uh, my heart of darkness story because the creator of that show was an Australian guy who uh, was also a director on one of the, we have crews of five, you know, the two plus a writer, the director and um, cameraman. Um, and I got emails from Sao Paulo that were about to go into the deep into the jungle to shoot some underwater cave diving. And the director who was the creator of the show uh, was getting drunk every night and beating up getting in fights with townspeople and got arrested. You know, it's like, and we're about to go into the jungle. Um, so I, uh, <laughs> I flew down immediately and I couldn't tell him what I was there for, but it was, it, I really felt like, you know, um, apocalypse now going into the jungle with somebody that was crazy. <laughs> and uh, we got to the, you know, where we were and we, and he, got drunk again and I had to take him aside and tell him that we, we had a second car and we were going to have him driven out of the jungle and put him on a plane to Australia and we had arranged for rehab and um, we did that and, and then the um, the person who was a writer who was on sort of like a new PM on the show said okay um, now who's going to direct the two episodes that we're supposed to shoot in there? <laughs> I said, uh, I guess I am. And <laughs> I never, it's uncredited, <laughs> not that I want credit for it, but I decided that this, this is my, I, after all the years of having directed theater, I finally got my opportunity and I, and I directed the next two episodes in the jungle. Um, and they turned out okay. I mean, nothing that I would put up for an award, but, um, you know. Did you ever think you're going to direct in the jungle and that's going to be a first no. experience? <laughs> No, that, but you have to, that's what you have to do in producing is like, okay, now you have to really think ahead and come up with plan B, plan C, and plan D, because oftentimes plan A is not going to work out mm -hmm. and you have to be ready to do that. And people are looking to you as a producer. Okay. What, what are the answers? What are we going to do <laughs> <laughs> on that? So uh, uh, that's, that's my advice is, you know, be prepared and be prepared for multiple endings yeah to 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 what you thought was you were going to be doing yeah and react to stress with a smile clearly <laughs> oh absolutely yeah <laughs> so now with the investors and producers is it investors who are choosing the producers or is it producers who are choosing the investors and how do these match <laughs> Um, there are some instances where you have investors who look for producers because they have a project that they want to get produced, but that's rare that producer that investors are going to look for a producer. They usually have a relationship with somebody in the business that they will call upon, not go out and interview various producers to do something. Mm -hmm. Investors are the person that the producers are looking for more often than that, you know, and they, they need to, um, you know, that's probably the area in which I, I probably, fell short in the most is that I'm not I'm, I was always good at pitching to a producer but I wasn't good at finding those investors um, and if you have investors you know, I'm happy to produce for you if you that's the way it goes though is, is that the um, the producers are always knocking on doors trying to find the investors mm -hmm. uh, for, and and you want an investor who ideally is hands off. Mm -hmm. um, I have in the past once I promised a, an investor that I would uh, sneak his girlfriend into a scene of the movie, um, but she wouldn't have a, a, a line. She wouldn't have a line to it. She would just be like, a, you know, that that, that's, as, that's as far as I'll go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. All right, so three key pieces of advice or maybe mistakes to avoid or lessons learned that you can tell our viewers to do or not to do. Um, well, the one thing I wish I had done was um, I remember after I was a litigator for a couple of years and hating the practice of law, um, 
I, I had an application filled out to go to AFI, the directing program. And then I got another job offer as a lawyer. And I'm, I, I, to this day, I still regret not doing the AFI. <laughs> because it would have, it would have, I don't regret my career. I've been happy with my career, but there was a part of me that it would have given me um, a, a background. And that, that's the piece of advice to give people is that develop an expertise. You can always broaden from a, a, a strong expertise if you are, um, if you're a writer. Mm-hmm. Um, you may not be able to, to to direct your first screenplay because you're a first time director and they love your screenplay, but unless you're willing to say, I'm going to hold it, I'm not going to give it up unless I can direct. Um, you, you probably won't get to direct it. Um, so you want to develop an expertise in something that you can parlay into other things. My expertise was um, being a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And it helped me. But when I, when I left Warner Brothers to go to Vestron and be head of acquisitions for, for Vestron, I didn't tell anybody I was a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And that was a, a deep dark secret that I had because I mean there were people who knew that I was but by and large I didn't tell people I was a lawyer because I had this impression that people viewed lawyers as being non-creative mm-hmm. and I didn't want people to say well I can give you my screenplay or I'll show you my foot film but is who is going to look at it besides you because you're not creative so you know it, now today, I don't think it's as much of a problem, but it, it is important to have an area that you can fall back on that, and not just fall back on, but is your entree mm-hmm. into the rest of the business. Whether, you know, if you're an actor and you start to actually, you, then you start to write because you want a good role that you're not seeing, you can then say, okay, you can use my screenplay, but I have to be that actor in that role. Yeah. Um, the same thing if you want to hold on to directing, if you're willing to, to you know, find the investors and find people that believe in you. Um, I don't know how many acquisitions, since acquisitions is not a, uh, a big thing these days, um, I don't know how many people will be willing to invest in somebody who's never directed before. You know, I mean, everyone has to be a first time director sometime. <laughs> you can't skip to your second film. But it's finding the right situation with the right company, the right screenplay, and the right package of things that will allow you to direct your first screenplay. Mm -hmm. Um, Anything else that I have on my notes here? Oh, find trusted mentors and advisors. And these are people that will tell you, no, you don't want to do that. Or will say, let me make a phone call for you and I'll see if he's available. Those are the things that will move you up the ladder much, much quicker than trying to do everything on your own. Um, help others because it'll come, you know, those are the people that you will call on for your first directing gig. Yeah. Um, um, and participate in the community. Be, you know, be part of it so that people know that you're around, whether it's, even if it means taking a job that may be below you, it's being on a set, you never know. It's the, it's the propinquity, I call it. The, Propinquity theory that if, uh, and I probably have, let me think, I can think of two jobs I've gotten in the past. I, um, uh, I remember I was in between work and I was covering for um, somebody, a lawyer that I knew who was going to the Cannes Film Festival. So I was sort of holding down his practice while he was gone. And when he came back, I came into the office to brief him on all the things. And while we were briefing, um, he got a phone call from somebody and he, I, I can hear he was recommending somebody for a job. And I said, what was that all about? And he goes, oh, you know, they, this um, Betty called me about, you know, they're looking for a head of um, the completion bond company, looking for somebody who can, you know, run the I said, well, why don't you recommend me? And he goes, are you interested? I went, oh yeah, that sounds like something interesting. So he called her right back and I got the job. Mm -hmm. But it's that ability to be in the room Mm -hmm. that allows you to have that access to possibilities. Yeah. You know, I I like to say that, um, you know, people believe in having lightning rod, you know, lightning is going to strike a lightning rod, but you've got to put out a thousand lightning rods. And that's the best way to make sure that lightning will strike. Yeah. One of them. Absolutely. Being active 
being in the right place at the right time, not being afraid to talk to people, 100%. Right. Oh, and, and don't take no. Huh? No. If it's, if it's your lawyer saying don't do something, because <laughs> they're telling you to protect you. But if it's a, a good example, um, I'm producing a, a documentary right now mm -hmm. that's based on um, – uh, the, the Fountain Theater, what I'm on the board of, did a program last summer called Walking the Beat. We took 10 um, kids, um, mostly kids of color, from L.A. city schools, mm -hmm. and they're teenagers, 14 to 18, and we took five LAPD cops, mm -hmm. and we put them together. They all volunteered, but they, uh, we auditioned them, and we put them together, and we had a construct of a... Um, a play that they would perform, but they had to write it for their own parts. They each had to make it their own. And they worked together for, I think it was about eight weeks of coming in for four or five hours a day, working with the cops, with the kids and getting to know each other and exercises and then you know, uh, and directing. Anyway, it, it went over that, um, that period. It turned out to be a fantastic program. The performances were knocked everyone out. It was touching. It was heartfelt. It was trust. It was, you know, you felt it was a healing process between cops and kids mm -hmm. seeing each other as real people. Mm -hmm. Well, we were doing it this summer again. We were going to try to repeat it with different kids and different cops when the pandemic happened. And we said, okay, we have to postpone it until next year. But that gives me more time because I decided what we want to do is do a documentary based on that. I don't know if you've ever seen a documentary, um, Cheer, Period. on uh, you know, uh, Netflix with the cheerleaders. And yeah. I want to do something like that where you set it up and then you show the progression. You show kids in their lives and their homes, the cops in their lives and their homes, mm -hmm. how they interact, what's going on, and the pitfalls, and then culminating in a performance. Mm -hmm. And I felt that this is, especially for this time, it, you know, to, to be able to bridge the gap of communication between cops and kids and kids, black kids mm -hmm. and Hispanic kids and cops would be a really important thing to do. So I pitched it to a friend of mine who is um, a well-known, um, he's produced, but he's a well-known uh, agent. Mm -hmm. And he said, nah, can't do it. I said, what do you mean can't do it? It's, it's perfect. And he goes, it shows cops in a good light and no one's gonna buy something about good cops right now because you know we're, we're, we're looking at all these other things that you know cops have done and we, you know, and we put false light on good cop shows and you know I, I don't see it it won't sell and I thought about it for a second I said thank you very much and I said I'll, I'll send you the link when it's done <laughs> and I, I'm not taking no for an answer because he was looking at it just from the narrow point of view of what might sell and he heard from other people at studios that we don't want good cop shows mm -hmm. but this isn't a good cop show it's how you frame it you don't look at you. This is a show about communication. This is a show about community. This is a show about trust. Mm -hmm. And if you frame it that way, it doesn't fall into the category of, oh, I'm rejecting all good cop shows. Mm -hmm. And that's the lesson that producers and you know, young people need to have is that just because someone says no, they may be saying no for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. They may not understand. They may not get it. Oftentimes they don't get it mm -hmm. or they, they want the easy way out. And it may be a little tougher to, okay, repackage it in a way that people will understand. But you shouldn't take no except from your lawyer who says don't do it because of legal reasons. Yeah. Other than that, keep on trucking. Yeah. Okay. Believe in your craft. And uh, to end this fantastic webinar with just so much that we've learned. Thank you. So to end this, whom would you like to nominate to be our next speaker to share words of guidance and help aspiring filmmakers and actors make it in this world? Who do I nominate? Uh, I'd have to talk to somebody first. <laughs> I can't think of anybody offhand, but I'll, I'll you think can of somebody. That... Nomination later. We're not going to put okay. anyone on the spot right now. <laughs> right. I don't want you know because I might tell somebody that says, "Oh no, I'm not going to do that." <laughs> think about it. But I, I would say, you know, I, I live through it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just fun. It really is. Thank you. We, well, we really enjoyed this, and we, as I said, learned so much, and just you answered so many questions that otherwise you just don't know where to find answers to and and this was wonderful and thanks to thank you everyone who submitted these great questions 
and uh, we hope that you can move up the ladder really fast and uh, thank you jason for helping with that process and so, happy to once okay. again jason zalin who was fantastic and so helpful and we really appreciate your time and guidance my pleasure and good luck to everybody thank you bye bye guys bye, -bye.